Well, hi everybody. Uh, this is the small group resource. Also, you can use it individually. Following up on the teaching that we've just shared this last weekend, we're still in this series. It's a brand new day. We're looking at the church in Antioch. And the title for the message is Outrageous Grace. I'll read just a couple of verses um, that we are focusing on. Barnabas had been uh, leading the church in Antioch for around a year. The work became rather heavy. And so he makes a rather unusual selection when it comes to bringing someone in as a co-leader to help him in the ministry there. It says in Acts 11, 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Outrageous grace. It might sound a bit like an outrageous title, but I stand by it because Jesus was looked upon as being outrageous. We read in Matthew 13 and verse 57, the response of some, it says they were offended at him. The word there is scandal, and he scandalized them with his gracious behavior. And here in Antioch, we see outrageous grace. Imagine that you're on a search committee looking for a new member of the pastoral team at Timberline, and somebody applies, you check into their resume to discover that not only are they uh, a reformed murderer, but that some people in the Timberline family have actually suffered because of this individual. It's probably not likely that they would get the job, but that's exactly what happens here in Antioch. We realize, first of all, that this is about Saul. And when you think about his background, it was terrible. He was there as a coat keeper at the execution of Stephen, giving approval, Acts 8, 1 says, to their killing him. He says in Acts chapter 22 that he persecuted followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women. He writes again about it in Acts 26 and verses 10 to 12. So this man was bad. And we celebrate the truth that whatever is in our history, wherever we have been, we are not beyond the grace of God. That doesn't mean that there might not be consequences to actions that we have taken, but the grace of God is outrageous. It's always available. And some Christians wrestle with that. I've met Christians who seem to be continuous shame addicts. And for them, their Christian faith is somewhat torturous because they're always living in their history. And there must have come a point where Paul, never forgetting his history, had to stand firmly in the grace of God. And then there was outrageous grace shown to Saul, who became Paul, without any fuss. He's the persecutor. He has caused so much pain. At one level, he's the biggest loser. He says that he's lost all things. Ten years earlier, Barnabas had helped the church in Jerusalem accept Saul's testimony. You can read about that in Acts chapter 9. And now Barnabas, wonderful Barnabas, he does it again. And it's his endorsement of Saul that enables him, Saul, to become part of the leadership in Antioch. What's going on here? God is using Saul as a model. God always uses not just persons, but people to model his truth. He doesn't just offer legislation. He offers examples like Israel and like the church. And God calls us to be a people who are working models and demonstrations of his amazing, outrageous grace. If that's going to happen, thirdly, we're going to have to look at people differently. And we're going to have to see them through God's eyes. Barnabas looked past the history of Saul and realized that in Acts chapter 9, God had decided that Saul was a chosen instrument. Surely God did that because he wanted a working model, someone who was a separatist, that's what the word Pharisee means, a separatist to now cross the ethnic, racial, religious divide and take the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, we've got to see that 
prejudice, racism, is not limited to one ethnicity. It's not a particular problem of one group. It's a human problem. And prejudice, as Ray Martinez shared with us last weekend, it isn't just about ethnicity. For him, it included being an orphan when, when the other kids were told not to, pl to play with him because of his background as an orphan. Prejudice categorizes people. And this last weekend, I used the example of how that can create all kinds of negative spin-offs where someone oppresses somebody from another group because they feel like they're better. The person from this group then looks at the oppressor and then judges everybody from that ethnicity. You're all the same. You see, categorization has taken place. I use the example of the tens of thousands, maybe many more, of our wonderful self-sacrificing law enforcement officials who sadly right now are feeling categorized and prejudiced against because of the unspeakable and evil actions of a few. And that too is wrong. All prejudice and categorization is wrong. It's a human condition. And if we're gonna be rid of it, that means that we're gonna to have to have gracious hearts and at times, well not at times, all the time, forgiving hearts. And forgiving is tough. It's easier to believe in forgiving than it is to live in forgiveness. It involves a journey that we need to take. And it involves us understanding that forgiving someone is not allowing them to be pardoned from the consequences of a crime. It is not pretending that what was bad was okay. It is uh, not looking to justify what was done by just dwelling on mitigating circumstances for someone else's behavior. And it doesn't always involve reconciliation and ongoing relationship because forgiveness can be offered, but trust may not be possible and the relationship may have broken down. Forgiveness though, I quoted psychologist Glenn Mac Harden, forgiveness releases us from prolonged anger, rage, and stress that have been linked to cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, hypertension, cancer, and other psychosomatic illnesses. We can break the cycle of anger and bitterness as we choose to forgive. Outrageous grace, that's what we're talking about. So. Let's, let's ponder a few questions if you're doing this as an individual, maybe dis discussion starters in the groups. First of all, when it comes to God's grace for us, why do we struggle with the idea that we're forgiven? What is it in our human condition that makes us want to pay? And then let's consider this. How might we react if somebody like Saul showed up and applied for a pastoral position. How could we model in Northern Colorado, in the nation, how could we be a people who more effectively model a sense of harmony and mutual respect? How do we look past the surface, the prejudice, the categorization, and can you think of an example where you had viewed a person in a particular way, but then when you got to know them better, you discovered that you'd actually been rather prejudiced about them? Because know this, prejudice tends to look for confirmation and edit out contradiction. When I'm prejudiced, when I categorize someone, I look for exhibit A, I look for evidence that will confirm my suspicion. But when they do something inconsistent with my judgment of them, I tend to ignore it or just say that it's a one-off. Can you think of a situation where your view of somebody changed? Finally, what would you say to the person who says, I just can't forgive? What kind, helpful, biblical advice might you offer if you were asked for it. Well, there you are. I hope that you'll enjoy your reflection and your discussion. Thank God for this truth. As you can see the stained glass window behind me that celebrates the ascension of Jesus. 
that again we affirm this truth, that because of his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the truth that he is coming again, so we can receive outrageous grace, and we can pass the grace around. God bless you.